all of this started uh, with us with, with a book that I wrote 12 uh, years ago, which is called Cells, Jails, and the Engines of Life. And that book dealt with biology. It dealt with the role of water in biology. And the main, the main point, the main theme of, of that book was that if you really, if you don't understand the role of water in biology, you won't understand biology. And uh, most attempts at understanding biology relegate water to a very secondary kind of role. They're very unimportant. Uh, water is essentially the carrier of the most important molecules of life, like proteins and DNA. Proteins do most of the work. And the water just sits there to suspend the proteins and not much more. The book uh, challenges that view and presents evidence that water is absolutely central to everything that the cell does. So, and out of that came the idea that the water that was sitting inside your cells and my cells is not like water in a glass. It's actually ordered next to surfaces. So it's something like this, if you have a protein, which your cells are full of, usually the charged uh, regions of the protein are on the surface of the protein and the water is right next to it. So what happens? Well, what happens is that the protein tends to order the water molecules out to some uh, level. And it, it was really difficult to figure out how far this ordering occurs. Now, the biology textbooks will tell you that there may be one or two or three ordered layers, not more. And the book suggested that there might be uh, dozens, uh, if not even up to hundreds of layers. And we we're, were interested in finding out much more about this kind of ordered water and what it was like and such. And the one clue that we had was that this acts pretty much uh, like a crystal because it's order, just like, for example, ice. And ice excludes particles and solutes as it forms to form the, the uh, very regular crystalline structure. So we knew that was the case. And we came upon that through the courtesy of a Japanese investigator. We came upon a neat method to figure out uh, s properties of this water and how far out it actually extended. And that's shown here. It's very simple. The, the, the hydrophilic surface is that of a gel. So here's the edge of the gel. We put the gel in the chamber. And then we dumped in a suspension of water and particles. And the particles that we use are microspheres. And they are just what they say, little spheres, micro-sized, typically one micrometer in diameter. And you can buy them. They are very readily available. And the idea was this, that if, if there is some kind of ordered water, and the ordered water tended to exclude these particles, by measuring the zone of occlusion, we could tell how many particles, there, how many uh, water molecules were ordered. This is, was not definitive, but it gave us some idea of what might be happening. So we did the experiment, and what happened, what we saw is that uh, at, at, right after we put the suspension in, the, the uh, particles were expelled progressively from this area. And the video stops here. If you look in the microscope, you'd see these particles dancing around in Brownian motion, but they would never enter back into this region. So this region looked like conceivably might be the extent of the exclusion zone, or the extent of the, so I should say, ordered uh, uh, water uh, region. And it was pretty large. We're talking 50 or 60 micrometers, which is substantial. So we call it the exclusion zone because it excludes particles, I'll show you later, solutes, or EZ, which is sort of easy to remember. So another example of almost the same, just to, to reinforce, is a, a piece of nafion. Nafion is a polymer, has a backbone, just like Teflon. It has a lot of charge groups, uh, sulfonate groups, which makes it charged. So you take a piece of nafion, you cut, uh, it's a sheet. So you cut the sheet as you like, lay it down on the bottom of the chamber, and add the suspension of microspheres in, in water and see what happens. And what happens is pretty much the same as I showed you in the previous slide. The, the exclusion zone builds, and it keeps building. And I stopped it prematurely here to actually build somewhat to maybe 400 micrometers, 300, 500, an enormous distance uh, by molecular standards that you can see even without the microscope that we, we use here. So by now, this finding has been confirmed in many laboratories. And in fact, we discovered that it was published in 1970 by a group, almost the same experiment. We hadn't known about it. Same results. So the first issue is, uh, is generality. Uh, uh, 
the, these exclusion zones, are they general or is it just these couple of examples here? And we spent quite a few years testing, and just to summarize, the surfaces that create these zones are many kinds of gels, many kinds of polymers, charged, especially hydrophilic polymers, biological surfaces, various sorts, and even single molecular layers on gold. Uh, self-assembled monolayers, that is, one molecular layer seems to be enough, it's like a template, enough to create whatever happens in the zone. What's excluded from it? We found essentially everything down to at least molecular weight 100 and even lower. Okay, 100 is, is clear and lower is, is iffy, but I think it's true. And, and just an example of small molecular weight substances that are excluded it is shown here. So at the bottom, we have a piece of nathion put in a chamber, and all we've done is add water and pH-sensitive dye. Now, the pH-sensitive dye, just like litmus paper, it changes color depending on pH. So the main point here, though, is that these dyes, it's a mixture of four or five different dyes of molecular weight, roughly 100 or so, and they're excluded from this region because you can see this region is clear, has no dye in it. You can see it better on my computer, but it, it's there. So, so that's an example of the kind of exclusion. More important, I think, is the pH value. So this has a, the orange color corresponds to a pH of three or less. That's very acidic. It means it's just full of protons, positively charged protons. We've actually measured in some cases using a different kind of probe, pH one. This is extremely full of, uh, thank you, full of protons. Uh, so, to summarize, um, oh, the, the, I just, just wanted to summarize the first issue that everything is, almost everything is excluded. Now, the next question is whether this zone really is physically different from bulk water. And I've suggested that it might be, that that's what's responsible for the exclusion, but I haven't really shown you any evidence. Now, what I'd like to do is to provide the evidence. I'm not going to do it in detail, except for one finding. Uh, most of it's been published, and it's also in the book that is sitting out there. Just quickly summarize, and I'll show you one uh, of one example of one of those pieces of evidence. The first is that the water molecules inside this exclusion zone are more constrained than bulk water and the technique we used, and the molecules are more stable uh, than bulk water. We found that this is not neutral. The molecules actually inside the exclusion zone are negatively charged, typically. Uh, we found that they also absorb light. They absorb light uh, very much at 270 nanometers. That's in the UV region. Bulk water doesn't. It's more viscous than bulk water. The molecules inside the exclusion zone are aligned. We measured by refringence, uh, used by refringence to show that. And the molecular structure appears to be different based on the infrared ab absorption. I'll go into that in a moment. Uh, different from bulk water. And optical properties differ also. The two Russian groups measured the refractive index of the exclusion zone water compared to bulk water, and it was about 10% higher. Both groups found the same. So I just want to briefly go through the negative charge because that's, that's really important for what follows. And, the experiment that we did to check it was we put a gel next to water. So inside means the inside of a gel. This is a polyacrylic acid gel. And we put it next to water. So outside the gel, inside the, uh, the gel. And we used two electrodes to measure the potential difference. These are microelectrodes, the ones that come that taper to less than one micrometer. So we have good spatial resolution. So you put one microelectrode out here as the reference. And the other one is the probe electrode, and you move it from point to point. So you can see it starts here at this distance from the interface. And at this point, the potential difference between this point and the reference is zero, which is good. That's what you expect. Nothing to change, no reason to find something different. And as you advance the probe closer and closer, you begin to pick up a negative electrical potential uh, here, down to 125 or so millivolts negative. And the region where of negativity corresponds roughly to the size of the exclusion zone. So it looks like the exclusion zone is negatively charged. We got rid of the gel and replaced it with a piece of nathion, did the same experiment, results are here, 
it's pretty much the same except quantitatively, you can see it differs, that the region of negativity begins quite far and becomes substantially negative roughly <coughs> around here and gets more negative. And Nathion's exclusion zone is correspondingly bigger. So it looks like, it looks like from these uh, measurements that the, the uh, exclusion zone is negatively charged. So it's a little odd that it's negatively charged because remember we started with water. Water's neutral. So how do you start with something that's neutral and you wind up with something that's negatively charged? You can't just invent the charge, uh, pull the charges out of the hat. So an idea is that, well, maybe the water molecules are somehow splitting into negative and positive uh, regions. We're measuring the negative one, and therefore a positive one should exist somewhere out there. And the question is whether it really does exist. Uh, can you identify it? Well, I've shown you from uh, uh, previous measurements that it does exist. So here's a slide that you saw earlier. I just turned it 90 degrees. Here's the exclusion zone, uh, which I just showed you is negatively charged. And remember, this red color corresponds to a very low pH, lots of positively charged protons. So indeed, we have negative and positive, and it looks like basically that the water is being split somehow into a negative and positive components. So we have a charged battery in water next to a hydrophilic uh, surface. So back to, to this list, if you want to find out more about what this EZ structure is, you, you look at a few of these characteristics that we've measured. The molecules are aligned, they're relatively stable and constrained, and so what does this correspond to? And I think the best description is it's some kind of liquid crystal. It doesn't tell you exactly what, what kind, but something like that. So, what I've shown you so, so far is summarized uh, here, that you have a hydrophilic surface next to water. Uh, we've known for a long time that at least a few molecules and molecular layers are ordered, but what we found now is that, first of all, it's something like a liquid crystal, which sort of fits this, uh, in a way. It has negative charge, which doesn't fit, because these are dipoles. Dipoles are neutral. You can stack an infinite number of dipoles and never get a net negative charge. We have a net negative charge, so unfortunately, this says something about this model. It doesn't work. This region excludes solutes profoundly. I've shown you evidence for that. And as I just suggested to you, it's not a dipole region, but something else. It may extend very far. The textbook says a few layers. Uh, if what I've shown you is correct, it's a few million molecular layers, depending on the surface uh, that, that we use. And the suggestion from all of the evidence that I've just summarized, I have presented it, is that it's different from ordinary water. Uh, and, and we suggested 100 years ago by a prominent physical chemist that water really ha doesn't have three phases. The solid, liquid, and vapor has four phases. There's some interfacial phase. And this idea of a fourth phase has sort of gone in and out of favor over the past century. Mostly it's been forgotten. And everybody learns that water has three phases. And it's possible that what I've shown you here is evidence for a a fourth phase, a distinct phase. It's bounded, it's a different structure, and there's a lot of it. So, uh, what, uh, oops, I guess I omitted the, uh, I omitted the, the important slide, but it's okay. I think the structure is actually a sheet-like hexagonal uh, structure that looks like this, which resembles ice in a way, but it's not exactly ice, and I, I didn't want to take the time to go through it, because many of you saw it from yesterday in previous lectures, and it's in the book, and I don't want to go to the rationale for it, but I can just say that there's a considerable amount of evidence that suggests that instead of dipoles, uh, this is a sheet-like structure built out of water next to these hydrophilic surfaces, and so they build uh, something like this. And, and this structure, um, if you look at it, and just take one plane, it looks something like this. And the ice structure, those of you who know it, consists of hexagonal sheets stacked up on one another. This is kind of like it, but the sheets are actually out of phase, shifted relative to one another. So it's not exactly ice. It's different, but it's ice-like. And if you count in these sheets, if you count the numbers of oxygens and hydrogens, hydrogens are here, uh, you might think, well, you know, water is 2 to 1 to H2O. This is not H2O. Actually, it's H3O2. So it's not water. 
This thing is, if this is correct, the water has undergone a chemical change to a new species that looks like H3O2, not H2O. Oh, so the answer to uh, question number two is the easy, physically distinct from the bulk, and I think the answer is yes. I've shown you evidence, and the best evidence we have is that it's a layered honeycomb kind of structure. Okay, now, next question is, if we have a battery, the exclusion zone is negative, the next region is positive, what charges the battery? You can't get something for nothing. Uh, and, and so, it's like your cell phone battery, you know, you need to plug it in periodically to recharge it, otherwise you're out of luck. So what charges this water battery? And it took us a few years before we finally got a hint uh, of what might, what might do, and it turns out it's light. And thank you, Don, for the introduction about light. Um, so, uh, it, incident, how did we find out? Well, we started with a casual experiment by an undergraduate working in the lab who walked by, we had a preparation here showing the microspheres and the exclusion zone, he brought over a lamp and shined the lamp on it. And uh, what happened was that, uh, so here's the exclusion zone, this is a piece of nafion, exclusion zone, microspheres, and when he came over with the lamp, the exclusion zone expanded, and when the lamp took away the lamp, the exclusion zone came back to its, its normal size. So from these experiments, we did many experiments, and we published several papers, and basically what we found is that all wavelengths of light from UV to uh, infrared through the visible were effective, but by far the most effective was infrared. Infrared wavelengths were reasons that are not clear. You'd expect that UV would have higher energy, but, but infrared was really powerful in growing this exclusion zone. We could, we could use weak infrared sources, weak enough that the temperature of the chamber would never increase by more than one degree, and we could, if, you, if it was on long enough, the exclusion zone could build to 10 times the original size. Um, so infrared, well, you know, infrared is typically is associated with heat. That's, when the, that's the most familiar manifestation, but actually infrared is all over the place. It comes from the chairs and the rug and you and, and, and me. And if we were to turn off all of these terrible lights uh, and, and do the experiment uh, growing an exclusion zone, we get pretty much the same result as if all the lights were turned on because there's an infrared coming from everywhere. If I were to use an infrared camera without these lights, I'd get a perfect image of, uh, of all of you. So infrared is literally free energy that we get. This is the energy, this free energy is what's used to build exclusion zones. So you have a situation like this, you have a material and easy water and you add uh, more infrared or just the infrared that's around and it grows the exclusion zone and um, okay, so the answer to um, question number three about the energy, this was a quick summary, a lot of results, uh, is that the exclusion zone buildup is powered by photonic energy which orders the water and basically charges the water battery. So the situation is sort of something like this. And if you, if you think about it, you know, it seems exotic. Light, water, etc. Uh, light giving energy. On the other hand, we think about the plant. Uh, what plants do, plants do exactly that. They take the energy, electromagnetic energy, from the environment and they use it, they convert it into chemical energy, which does all kinds of work, uh, metabolic uh, work, and growth, bending, uh, what have you. And I'm suggesting that the same thing occurs in water. It's not a surprise because the plants are made mostly of water. So, so this glass of water contains energy. Um, and that's why I use this uh, familiar equation, <laughs> uh, almost familiar. Uh, uh, you, you guys are mostly Einsteinian, so an equation similar to this is one that you know quite well. But I, what I meant is even though the units don't match, that it's hard to separate energy from water. Okay, so now what about biology and health? I want to move uh, to that. And um, uh, what, what's the, how does this water stuff somehow relate or possibly relate to health? And I, I'm going to present to you a potpourri of different ideas which may seem somewhat uh, un, un linked to one another, and a lot of it is speculative. I want to suggest to you that the, the water and light 
play a very critical role in your health. Okay, first thing is, um, you know, we receive infrared energy all the time, and also visible light and, and such, and the question is whether, just like plants, whether we can use this energy for anything useful, or do we simply absorb it, re-radiate it, without making any use of it? Well, I presented evidence that um, you can put a tube in water, a hydrophilic tube, and get flow, perpetual flow through the tube that was mediated by the absorption of light. So water really does act as a transducer. It converts uh, electromagnetic energy into mechanical energy of flow. But so, so we receive this energy, and just like plants, uh, the question is whether we do pretty much the same thing that plants do. In other words, uh, do we uh, sort of photosynthesize? Now, I'm not suggesting that we photosynthesize, sorry, uh, but I'm suggesting to you that we might use light in, in some ways. Of course, photosynthesis involves many different steps, some of which are not known. The first step in photosynthesis is to take the light next to a hydrophilic substance, a chromophore, and split the water into positive and negative. That's exactly what we're talking about here. So, so you know, if you were, if you were nature, uh, mother nature, and you uh, progressed from plants to animals, would you t simply drop a, a process as successful as photosynthesis, or at least the first step or two of photosynthesis, or would you keep it as a maybe a backup measure, or even more than a backup measure? So I'm suggesting that that actually may be possible, that you're using this energy. Now, if that's true, the question arises, well, gee, you know, if we're getting energy from water, uh, can we avoid eating? Sounds preposterous, but some of you know that uh, there are people uh, called breatharians who essentially don't eat, uh, they basically just drink, and actually one example, someone in a humid environment who actually doesn't even drink, doesn't eat. Now, I'll just show you about this guy because I happen to know very well about this fellow. Some of you who know Prahalad Jani reported he came, he grew up in a cave somewhere in India, and he claims that he was approached at age seven or eight by angels, and the angels told him that he didn't need to eat or drink, in fact. And after 65 years, he went, he reported himself to the local government and said, I haven't eaten or drunk anything for 65 years, and you guys ought to know it. So, obviously, it sounds like this is the biggest malarkey that you ever heard of. However, I think it's not. And, and the reason I think it's not is that I came into contact with the uh, physician who led a group of 15 physicians who examined this guy, put him in the hotel room, uh, in the hospital room, sorry, for two weeks, and the place was sealed, filled with video cameras and filled with physicians uh, ranging from urologists to pulmonologists to psychologists and whatever. And they examined this guy, not for 65 years, but for two weeks. And they certified that this guy didn't eat or drink anything for two weeks and he was just fine. They made numerous physiological measurements which were reported at a water meeting that we conduct uh, annually. And I must say, this was absolutely convincing. And the physician in charge told me that this guy, when he was finished in a couple of weeks, he could run up the stairs faster than the physician who examined it. So, so I think it is possible. Now, a lot of people, a lot, a sizable number of people can really get on without, without eating. And a few books have been written and lots of discussions. This in Seattle, where I come from, just in the past two weeks, a woman finished fasting for, uh, I think, 45 days or something like this, and feels just fine after that. She decided to go back to, to eating. All she did was drink. And so these people, uh, almost to, to the last person who do it, claim that they somehow get their energy from light. Now, we talked a lot about light and how light hitting the water separates charge, creates potential energy, builds easy water, which fills your, your cells. So there's a possibility that this, the energy that we're getting is, and the ability to, to accomplish seemingly miraculous feats like this 
uh, it may come from light that's, uh, that's around us. Light really sustains us. And one of the books that was written by a fellow who's done this, it's called Life from Light. So, okay, so now I'd like to turn to um, an another issue. I said this would be a potpourri of issues, and uh, maybe it's a little bit disorganized, but I want to talk about ultra-low friction. So the question is, how come your joints don't squeak, right? So when I do this, my joints, I mean, sometimes they squeak a little bit, but they, basically they don't squeak. Now, so how does biology accomplish this miraculous feat? Well, you know, when you talk about friction, you're really talking about asperities. So if you shear two surfaces by one another, the, the bumps tend to collide with, with one another, and uh, the result of that is, uh, is uh, that you get friction. So if you can avoid those bumps, you can reduce the friction. Uh, so you can see that in the case of the two the mountain peaks, if you have somewhere were able to separate them, then they'd shear by one another with no problem, and friction would, would diminish. So if you have two surfaces that have some roughness, every surface has roughness, if you could uh, somehow separate them, so, for example, if, if, these are, if this is a hydrophilic material and a hydrophilic material, and you put water in between, well, most of us would say, well, sure, you put water in between, you get lower friction. But I think it's more than that. I think it's that if these are hydrophilic materials, you get an exclusion zone here, you get an exclusion zone here, and as I mentioned to you, you get lots of protons here, huge numbers of protons. Now, these protons repel each other. Because they repel each other, they push the surfaces apart. And I think this is the principle of low friction. I think it also operates on the surface of ice, something similar to this. So if you look at a joint, uh, this is a, a typical joint. You have a bone here and a bone here, and a ligament connecting these two. And the bones don't rub on each other. They have an interesting structure. It, it's called the joint capsule. And what it does is it, this region here is lined with cartilage. And cartilage is nothing more than a gel, and cartilage is, is right here. And so because this is um, a gel, and this is a gel, you should have an exclusion zone here, an exclusion zone here, and it should be filled with protons. And those protons can't escape because you have this capsule keeping them in. So the situation here may look something like this. Here's cartilage, here's cartilage corresponding to these green ones. And in between, you have these protons that I talked about. And these protons will keep the two bones apart from one another. And people who investigate joints like this claim that no matter how much load you put on the bones, they don't touch it. The cartilage surfaces don't actually touch one another. <coughs> Nobody can understand why. And I think this may be the reason. So I think this is the reason, the, the reason why we actually have uh, uh, low friction in our joints. It has to do with those protons. Okay, now what about pathology of, of those joints? So, for example, you sprain your ankle. I don't know how many of you had this experience or break. You look at your ankle, it swells, but it swells, it takes seconds. It's, it's not a long-term process, it's practically immediate, and maybe you never asked yourself, why does it swell so quickly? It does something like this if you sprain your ankle. And if you think about the structures that are inside um, your ankle, besides bones and such, all of the muscles and connective tissues, I'll just give you an example of why I think this happens. So if you look at muscles, so this is an electron micrograph, a uh, scanning electron micrograph of muscle. We studied muscles for many years. And these are called myofibrils, and they run along one another. These little fuzzy ball-like structures are mitochondria. And the point I want to illustrate here is that this myofibril is connected to this one, which is connected to this one, and so on. So they can't expand uh, laterally very much. And there's a limit, the elastic limit. Now, if you look, even the same principle applies if you look inside one of these. And this is a micrograph showing the, the protein filaments that are inside. Now, these are so-called thick filaments here. And the thin filaments are actually pulled out because this is a stretched uh, muscle. And you see a few interesting things, uh, uh, the, the most prominent of which are these interconnections between here. These are known as cross bridges between uh, thick uh, filaments. They're ladder-like structures. You, you can see that run from here to here. So what does that mean? Well, convention, conventional point of view is that these are actually used in force generation. 
and they, they may be, but in terms of the ability of this lattice to expand, they, they put constraints on the expansion because you, know, you have to pull on these cross links and they can expand just so much. So this keeps your tissue from expanding very much in the face of forces that might want to expand, it, like EZs building next to these protein surfaces. So um, the cross links restrain EZ buildup. I'll just show it more, more clearly here. So here's one of those thick filaments. Here's another one. And these are the cross links. So you can imagine next to these uh, protein filaments, you have EZ layer here and another one and another one. And they start building up from each of these filaments. And they build and build and build. And they're not, they're going to try to build to a million layers and really stretch things out. But they can't because these links constrain the, the uh, uh, separation between the filaments. However, if you have an injury, you get rid of them, they break, some shear, you sprain your ankle, then when that happens, there's no restraint to swell it. And so even easy layers now can build up essentially as much as they like. And if they do, which I think they do, this is what happens. And I think that's the reason why when you sprain your ankle, uh, why the, the, uh, it swells in the matter of just a few seconds. And I think also the principle is similar for, for uh, the gels and polymers that, that swell, but we won't go into that. Okay, now next, what about the role of the exclusion zone in the health or behavior of cells? So, cells are full of proteins. Around each protein are easy layers, so cells are basically full of easy water. And this actually underestimates uh, what the packing that is uh, that you see inside the cell. I'll show you in, the, in a moment. Because of tight packing of these proteins, they're actually right next to each other practically. Most of the water inside is easy water. It's almost all interfacial water. And, and the cell, because it's almost all this negatively charged easy water, the cell is negatively charged. You know, this is not rocket science. So, if you look inside the cell to see what the structure is really like, according to uh, famous uh, uh, drawings, uh, renderings from electron micrographs, you can see that it's really tightly packed. This is a 10 nanometer scale uh, here. In fact, the average surface to surface distance between macromolecules is seven water molecules. That's how tightly packed it, it all is. And so, if it's basically all interfacial water, then most of the cell water is easy water, and which we've known previously, but it just em emphasizes the fact. Now, if most of the water is easy water, then and easy water is negatively charged, then the cell is full of basically negative, has negative electrical potential. And it's been known for 70 years now that if you stick an electrode into a cell, you get negative electrical potential, 100 millivolts, 90 millivolts, something like this. And I think the reason is very simple. It's just that the water is negatively charged. If you, those of you who know biology and who read a biology book, the mechanism that's suggested, it's very complicated. It has to do with the membrane. It has to do with pumps and channels and what have you. Oddly, people have not taken into account the fact that if you stick the same electrode into a gel made of polymers or proteins, no membrane, but the same electrical potential, pretty much. So the idea that is pervasive throughout all of biology, that the electrical behavior of the cell has something to do with the membrane, I think the evidence is against that. Now, this is a, a cell that's just sitting there and not doing anything. But cells do things, like for example, a muscle cell contracts. It mostly it's just relaxed, but it, it undergoes, it, it does stuff. A secretory cell secretes. Uh, a nerve cell conducts uh, signals along its length, uh, so-called action potential. And I showed in this book that these kinds of actions involve water as a central player. That it's a phase transition that the EZ water that mostly fills the cell converts to bulk water transiently. And that's what precipitates the action. That's what, for example, precipitates the, the muscle contraction. Now when that happens, of course, bulk water is neutral. So you go from negative electrical potential to zero electrical potential, and then the restoration back to the original state, you go back to the negative uh, electrical potential. 
So just shown diagrammatically, what I'm trying to say is that is that when you have action, when the cell gets goes to work and does what it's designed to do, uh, then electrically, what happens is you go from say nominally 100 millivolts. This is because of the EZ water is negative. When the cell acts, the EZ water converts to bulk water, and you get roughly uh, zero. And then it restores. And you go back to EZ. So this this applies to any cell, whether it's a muscle cell that contracts, a nerve cell that conducts, or a secretory cell what have you. The same principle applies. So this is called the action potential. Uh, I didn't give it the name, but it's known now for, uh, I think, 70 or 80 years. And it's the same thing that happens along your nerve. So, so when the nerve conducts a signal, you get an action potential. That is, the water converts from the, the easy to bulk back to easy, transiently. Uh, now, I want to turn to anesthetics because all of you who have had surgery know that, uh, or pain, whatever, that it, anesthetics eliminate sensation. And it, it, it does it, at least in part, by wiping out the action potential. So if the nerves can't signal anymore, you don't feel the pain. Or your brain's not working, and so you go to sleep, and you wake up in the next few hours, and your surgery is, is all done. I started my career as a bioengineer in the Department of Anesthesiology. And I can tell you that nobody understands how anesthetics work. Uh, there are all kinds of theories, but you know, they don't, their act is not together. And they're still trying to figure out how anesthetics work. And I think we've figured it out. Um, I think um, uh, if, you follow, if you follow the logic, um, we know that anesthetics uh, will, will get rid of the action potentials, and the action potentials depend on the exclusion of this negative potential inside. If you don't have that, you can't get this phasic change of potential. So the hypothesis then is, well, if that's true, if you have, a, if you have an exclusion zone, the anesthetic should wipe out the exclusion zone, and that will explain why you don't get any action potentials anymore. So we tested it. We used two local, we took a typical chamber where we measure exclusion zone with microspheres and such, and we applied local anesthetics. Uh, two common ones, one is bupivacaine and the other is lidocaine. And you can see that as you increase the dose, the action, the, sorry, the exclusion go, zone goes from a normal size down to a much smaller size. This is reversible, and the concentrations used here are similar to clinical concentrations. So, they both show pretty much the same result. And then we decided to try also a general anesthetic, the one that's commonly used now, isofluorane. And we get pretty much the same result, except we have this little pip here at extremely low concentrations. Well, it turns out that it's well known among anesthesiologists that if you have a very low dose of anesthetics, it's an excitatory state, not a depressive state. And in fact, when you get an anesthetic, as the concentration builds up, you go through this excited state before you go through the, uh, the anesthetic state. So, so these results um, suggest that the mechanism of anesthesia, that the anesthetics act by, by exerting some effect on the water. Now again, this seems a radical hypothesis. However, none other than Linus Pauling, many years ago, suggested the same. He said, you know, the noble gases, xenon, argon, whatever, they're anesthetics. But they don't interact with anything except water. They form uh, clathrates with water. He said, I think that the mechanism of anesthesia involves water. And I think he was right. OK. Now what about pathologies and sickness? The um, question is, well, what is a pathology uh, to start with? And um, what do we mean by? pathology or sick cells. Well, if you have a healthy cell, as I tried to elaborate, you have the proteins, and the proteins are very crowded. They're working just fine. And around each protein is, is easy water. And the cells are full of easy water, so the cell has a good, healthy, negative potential. I wish it were positive, because I hate that we're called negative. <laughs> but, but it's OK. But, yeah, but terminology. That's a healthy cell. Now, what about a pathological cell? Well, in a pathological cell, the proteins are not functioning. But the proteins, it's not just protein. Around every protein is easy water. So really, it's a problem with the protein and the water, or the protein and or, or the water. 
and the cell is not, not functioning well because the proteins are not able to do what they normally do to perform some, some kind of action. So there's something wrong with the proteins, but also the cells have less easy water, and pathological cells don't have minus 100 millivolts. They're, they may be minus 60 or minus 50 or, or whatever. Those are sick cells. They're barely functioning. We experimented with them for many years in, earlier in my career. Now, so to, to kind of check this idea, um, we decided let's look at the substance that repairs, uh, reverses problems that we have. The first one that comes to mind is aspirin. So, you know, whatever bothers you, whether it's a headache or inflammation or uh, uh, what have you, you take aspirin, and aspirin seems to uh, reduce this fever. It seems to help a lot. Now, why does it help a lot? Well, nobody knows exactly why it helps a lot, but I would suggest that the hypothesis was is that, well, it, it repairs this, it brings this back to its pristine state by building EZ. Right, and doing that, so we did experiments with aspirin, and, um, and since aspirin reverses various maladies, and the question is whether it really does build disease. And unfortunately, I don't have the final results, but I, these are representative results. This was being, this experiment was carried out by an extremely talented high school student uh, with supervision, um, and the, so here's the control. This is. This is um, um, a surface, and here are the microspheres, and the exclusion zone is 300. And this is just one example, and she has many. Uh, sometimes the exclusion zone in the presence of low concentrations of aspirin will build to up to five times the size as in the control case. So uh, the data are now being processed and uh, written up, so I don't have the final result, but it's clear that um, aspirin builds EZ. So, so we conclude that aspirin and anesthetics do what we might expect them to do, and it confirms the central role of exclusion zones in cell function. OK, next topic. I have two more, I think, uh, quick ones. Is your body neutral or charged? I don't know if you ever thought about that. And most of us are pretty sure that our bodies are neutral, right? No. No. What do you think? I, I can't see who you are, but I'm glad to hear it. I'm hiding in the back. Okay. And what do you think uh, the charge is? I think it might be negative. I think you're right. Okay. Uh, but now, if you were to get up in front of a group and say, I think your body is negative, uh, it might not be too popular. But, but just look at the arithmetic. That's uh, why I never hide in the front. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're, uh, roughly 60% of the volume of your body are cells, okay, and, and the cells are negative. Everybody knows that. Now, the extracellular space, depending on where you look, maybe 20% or so of your space, and the extracellular space consists of collagen, elastin, various negatively charged proteins, which attract a lot of easy water, which is negatively charged. So we're, we're totally now with like 80% of your body is built of negative charges, so we start building up. Now, what about the positive charges? Well, the spaces with the protons, the first one you think of is urine, because urine has a low pH, so you pee and you get rid of positive charges. You get rid of, and when you sweat, the sweat has low pH, so you get rid of positive charges. When you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide and water, carbonic acid, full of protons, so you breathe out positive charges. So, so out of this, uh, you know, this simple arithmetic, it looks, like, it looks like we're negatively charged, we're not neutral. And so a hypothesis, a simple hypothesis, is that the body strives for the highest negativity. You are negative, you're not neutral, I would propose. Now, it, it, um, this is came out of arithmetic, but you, if you think of the plant kingdom, um, you think of uh, that, that you know, plants are connected to the earth, and we know that earth is negatively charged, it's not neutral. So if you have something that's stuck into a, a something negative, it's likely to be negative. And indeed, you just add up all the, the cells in the plants, and you come to the same conclusion that it too is negative. So I think, 
um, that maintaining negativity is a, <laughs> so, that doesn't look right. <laughs> I think psychologists will not like this. Um, but I think everything, <laughs> maintaining electrical negativity is a fundamental attribute of, of life. Which leads to, uh, if this is true, this is a sort of new principle that, uh, I mean, I, I think it's, it's true, it's something that we've not appreciated or recognized before, which leads to the idea of antioxidants. Now, you've all heard of antioxidants, and, and the physicians and alternative medical people, they're saying, well, you should take antioxidants all the time because it keeps you healthy. There are a dozen different mechanisms put forth as to why they keep you healthy and each one is mutually exclusive with, with, with the others. And so, you know, we look for a simple general mechanism. If you think about it, I think it's simple. So remember basic chemistry, reduction is a gain of electrons, and oxidation is the loss of electrons, right? And so we're talking about oxidation, oxidants here, and loss of electrons. So antioxidants, anti, should prevent the loss of electrons, right? And, and therefore, if you, if, you, if you prevent the loss, it maintains negativity, and therefore, it should promote health, because health, I think, is equivalent to maintaining that negativity. By the way, it's well known, some of you know, that if you expose yourself to negative charges in the environment, you feel good and you get healthy, and positive ions is the opposite. That's well known. Now, what about water? Um, uh, returning to, this is the sort of last few minutes of uh, health benefits from drinking water? Is that possible or is that nonsense? About 25 years ago, a book appeared. It's called, as you can see, Your Body's uh, Cries for, for Water. You're not sick. You're uh, thirsty. Okay, this is uh, written by, by a, a physician, a prominent physician from Iran. And he got the idea that water was critical for your health. So a patient would come to him with this complaint or that complaint. And he said the same thing that your grandmother said, drink more water. <laughs> and he reports in this book that this is, this is a, like a cure-all. Just drink a lot of water and you'll remain healthy. So his point of view is that we, we, we're missing ourselves, or missing adequate water, adequate hydration, and we need to replace it. So, so he said, just drink more water. But I think that some kinds of water are better than other kinds of water. So if we look inside water, uh, now, water is, is uh, the ultimate solvent, and so you have a particle or a solute or something, and you have EZ water uh, surrounding it, and then you have these, these protons. And one of the interesting features uh, is that when you have minus and plus, you have a high dipole moment, right? And that's characteristic if you have EZ water, you have these dipole moments. And so, so if you think about it, so the cells are full of uh, EZ water, and uh, the cells are negative, and the cells that are, are sick are also negative, they're just slightly less negative, then think about drinking EZ water. Well, first, if you drink regular water without EZ, ultimately those cells will rehydrate as they need to. But if you drink EZ water, remember, EZ water has big dipole moments because it's got lots of separated charges. So what happens is that those, those dipoles orient the right way, plus on this side, close to the negative cell, and get drawn in very quickly. And I think that's why, that's why EZ water rehydrates cells very effectively. And uh, I'm not going to tell you about all the evidence, but, but people come to me because we run these water meetings annually, and various people have produced various kinds of water, and they have vast evidence, although not the double-blind clinical studies that we've all come to accept, but very impressive evidence that water not only can improve of various types, can improve your health, but actually that they can reverse pathologies. And I'm happy to talk with you afterward for in, in details. We would like very soon to do objective tests on these waters to really see which ones are the best and which ones improve health. And also, if you think about drinking easy water, right, you have separated plus and minus, that's potential energy. Now, if you, if you swallow potential energy, um, potential energy doesn't vanish, so what does it do? Well, again, you could just radiate it out, or it's possible that, uh, you know, that the water contains energy, no calories, but, uh, but lots of energy. And so, you know, you can remember the times when you've gone through some athletics uh, and 
and you're sweaty and tired and you drink a few glasses of water, suddenly you feel energized again. It could be psychological, but you really have to ask how much energy actually comes from the potential energy that's contained in the water, perhaps more than you would think. Okay, so the main, main conclusions here are um, that uh, uh, I think there are, there are two or three. The first one is I wanted to emphasize the fact that, that water is not, it's not just a solid liquid and vapor. We've identified what we believe to be uh, another phase of water. It's distinctly different from this one and distinctly different from this one, but it has some features of, of both of these. In fact, the molecular structure is kind of close to that. And I haven't told you this, but in the book uh, you will find uh, that in order to go from water to ice, in order to freeze, you must, it's obligatory to go through this phase and this phase. And if you melt the ice, it's obligatory to go through this phase before you get to this phase. And the evidence is in the book, no time to tell you. So, so water has four phases, I think not three phases. And water is getting energy from the environment all the time. Water is not just sitting there in equilibrium with the environment, it's actually a, uh, an engine of sorts. It's taking in energy from outside and transducing that energy into other kinds of energy, one or two of which I just mentioned, but uh, there are more. And I think that this water is centrally tied to your health, and maintaining this kind of water around each protein inside your cell allows those proteins to do what they normally do uh, to perform whatever function the cell is, is required to, to, to do. And if this easy water is missing for whatever reason or is reduced, then your function is not optimum. And you need to replenish it in order to build back up to optimum function. I have a fair amount of contact with some of the alternative medicine uh, people, and more and more of these people are turning from probiotics and vitamins and such as, as the cure-all and antioxidants to water as the central entity involved in maintaining health. And I think this is a revolution that's coming in the future. So a lot of this stuff uh, is, is, is included in, in, in the book, and there are some signed copies out there. And you could also, if you choose not to, buy one of these books. They're pretty cheap. Uh, you can look at, at ebnerandsons.com, the, the website for the book, and read a few chapters free, free of charge if you prefer to, to, to do that. So I think I'll stop here, and because uh, I've used up all my time, and entertain some questions if you have any.